Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good Hello. Hi, Hello. Robert. 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 Hi. Hi. Nice to see you. Hello, Robert. Hi, how are you? Very well. Uh -huh. Lovely. So we're on YouTube now as well. I would just like to check you can hear me. I can hear you. Can hear you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank goodness. Okay, fine. <laughs> testing, testing. Okay, good. Thank you. All right. How, how many are you up to? Oh, but I'm glad that, who's looking at 41. you? Two? 41 so far. Yeah. It's very early. Oh, no. Not so early. <laughs> Maybe for you, Jack. <laughs> oh. Hola. Hola. Hi, Paul. Hi. 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 Well, it's just on time. Mm. Okay, so should we start then? Are you there, Jim? Um, Hello. Hello, Paula. <laughs> Hello, Andrew. Hello. Long time no speak. <laughs> Long time no speak. <laughs> right, we'll get going then, shall we? And other people will then join us. Um, we... You're, you're here. You, you've got you down as being. Oh. I'm on there. Yeah. Hmm. I'm on here. Okay, that's fine. You're just not showing up. No, because I'm muted. Oh. Sure. I was creating an echo. Doesn't look like. Sure. And I turned off my video. Ah. Uh, right. yeah. Are we muted? Yeah, Julie, Julie, can I can I just make a request as as host? Is it worth muting all participants now? Yeah. Right. Are you ready, Judy? Right. Okay, can you all hear me? If Michael, you're muted. I have muted everybody. Okay. You need to unmute yes, Michael. Michael is muted. Michael, you're muted. Okay, you can hear me now. Good evening, everybody. My name is Michael Kelly, and on behalf of our new Wimbledon Cultural Events and Activities Committee, I'd like to thank you all for participating in our largest Zoom event to date with 121 registrations so far people are still coming in. Apologies to anyone excluded over our 100 limit, but it can also be accessed on Wimbledon Synagogue's YouTube channel from the link on your registration details. The format for the next hour is the questions will be first be asked, received in advance, but we'd like to encourage your use of the chat facility and indicate you would like to ask a question if there's time at the end. Now, before introducing Lawrence, I would like to dedicate the event in loving memory of Irving Childs and James Leake for their tireless work and devotion over many, many years towards both Wimbledon Synagogue and the wider communities, Jewish and non-Jewish alike. I have no doubt they would both have been with us tonight, posing their own questions. So Lawrence Friedman uh, is originally from Whitley Bay on Tyneside and a member of Wimbledon Synagogue and is probably the UK's leading authority on post-war history and has been described as the Dean of British Strategic Studies. Born in Tynemouth, as, he, as I said, he is currently America's pro Professor of War Studies at King's College London. Lawrence was awarded a CBE in 1996, appointed the official historian of the Falklands campaign in 1997, awarded a KCMG in 2003, 
and made a Privy Councillor when appointed a member of the Iraq Inquiry in 2009. He's the author of some 30 books, including the standard history of the Cold War, and most recently, Strategy, a History, and probably the most pertinent to tonight's subject, The Future of War. He's also a speechwriter for Tony Blair and regular commentator on radio and in print on a variety of topics, most recently current COVID. In his spare time, Lawrence, I'm told, is a strong supporter of Newcastle United. Lawrence, if I may, um, it seems obvious to start this evening on the basis of the title I gave you. Are we on the brink, or I think since I gave you the title, are we actually in the Cold War, the Second Cold War? Well, thanks, Michael. Thanks for the introduction. And uh, let me just say for myself how honoured I am that uh, this is in the name of uh, James and Irving, who uh, uh, such valuable members of the community. Uh, let me uh, start the question with uh, what is a Cold War? Uh, the term actually goes back to the, sort of the phony war of the Second World War. It, it's the idea of a time when you're not actually seeing a lot of fighting, but it could get bad. So you can't have a Cold War without the possibility of it turning into a hot war. Um, and I think when we talk about a Cold War, that's the issue that's behind it. Uh, is it likely to turn into something much worse? Because there's no doubt that there's a degree of antagonism, not only with Russia as a successor to the Soviet Union, but also now with China. Um, it's important to note some very important differences, certainly with regard to Russia. If you go back uh, to the main, to the Cold War that we think about starting uh, in the mid forties, as the second world war ended, and coming to dramatic conclusion uh, following the fall of the Berlin Wall in November 89. Um, it was marked by uh, an adversary to the, to, to, the, to the Western alliance that was large, had its own alliance, the Warsaw Pact. Uh, for a while, the, the Soviet Union was the world's second biggest economy, uh, but it represented a totally different social system. So there was a, a very strong ideological component well, now Russia um, has lost its alliance. It's lost an awful lot of the Soviet Union. Uh, much of that is uh, its old alliance, the Warsaw Pact, is now by and large joined NATO as of the three Baltic states that used to be part of the Soviet Union. Its economy is somewhere close to Spain's. Um, it's, it doesn't really have a compelling ideology, it has a lot of problems of its own, but it throws its weight around uh, as it can. Uh, and has become a pretty um, uh, aggressive, in some ways, member of the international community, uh, notably in the areas that used to be the Soviet Union. So much of its activity is in the areas that used to be, in a sense, home territory. But it's also moved quite dramatically into Syria as well. So uh, it, it, it's different uh, to what it was before because Russia just isn't as strong as the Soviet Union was as strong. And has big problems. One of the great continuities, going back to the, the idea of a Cold War, is that a hot war is incredibly dangerous still, because with the start of the Cold War, the original Cold War, came nuclear weapons. Uh, nuclear weapons haven't gone away, and that is what makes war between great powers so dangerous and, uh, and worrying, but also it has been one of the main factors why conflicts that may well have erupted into a third world war in the past haven't done so. Uh, so um, it's different, there's tensions, um, but we're still probably some way from the risk of a cold war turning into a hot war. Um, to what extent do the number of potentates trying to prolong their positions of power, most using corruption, make the world a more dangerous place? Well, can they in fact provide stability in their own countries? Uh, is this more the case now or than it was in the days of Stalin? Um, are we talking about within Russia itself or, uh, well, well, or generally? I mean, um, in China, um, well, I, yeah. in Belarus and everywhere. Everywhere, yeah. So um, for much of the uh, 
Cold War, a lot of uh, clearly those countries that were under uh, Soviet satellites were, were, were all uh, authoritarian, were potentates, they were party hacks by and large. Um, then you have in the Middle East a, a, a number of countries, some of which are friendly to us, um, that are uh, the are monarchies, feudal. Um, as the Cold War the, the, came to an end in 1989-90, uh, there was a sort of surge of democracy and many countries that had previously been authoritarian uh, became uh, demo uh, democratic, including to a degree Russia. Belarus never really quite made it, um, but Russia to a degree. And um, one of the things we've seen over the past few years um, is countries that seemed either to be democratic or tending in that direction have moved backwards. Um, Russia is one of them, Turkey, um, another, even China, which had a much more open plural system um, until the currently the Xi Jinping came along uh, about six years ago. Um, that, that has become much more authoritarian, much more focused on social control. Um, but they're all authoritarian in their own way. I mean, they, 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 they don't all fall into a simple pattern. Some of them um, are very conscious that they stay in power so long as they can keep their people happy. I think that's probably um, the view in China. Uh, others uh, are corrupt, and simply corrupt, and, and they use the um, uh, supreme power in order to, to line their pockets. Uh, and um, I suspect Lukashenko in Belarus is one of those. Uh, Yanukovych, who was the leader in Ukraine uh, until he ran away in February, uh, 2014 left behind him um, a private zoo with his own Spanish galleon uh, and uh, 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 large amounts of documents indicating that corruption was done on an industrial scale, indeed organized throughout the state. So it varies enormously, but by and large authoritarian states by definition are going to be illiberal and repressive um, and they provide a cover for being very corrupt. They don't necessarily mean that they want war. Uh, doesn't yeah. necessarily mean that they're going to be more aggressive. Um, but uh, ask one, one more question, Lawrence, before we go on specifically to China and to Russia. Um, what do you think should be the criteria for the imposition of econ economic sanctions and boycotts? And does this make the world a more dangerous place? Well, it, it, it's an interesting question. When it goes back to what I was saying about um, the difficulty, which is good, of turning a cold war into a hot war at the moment because of the fear of escalation um, and, and nuclear use. So despite all the provocations, uh, by and large, uh, kind of, there's a holding back, they're, they're very aware of the risks of, of major conflict. So that means you, you do other things. Uh, so Russia, we know, is fiddled with elections, it's other people's elections, it has cyber campaigns, it does information campaigns. Uh, what the West has, has tended to do is to impose economic sanctions. And these have been discussed at the moment with regard to Belarus. Um, they're still in place uh, on Russia over, over the seizure of Crimea in 2014. Um, the problem with economic I mean, economic sanctions can, can have an effect. Um, but they're done often to, as something to do, to show that we care. Um, that we, we don't take these things lightly, but they're not necessarily very effective. And in the case of the United States and under Trump, they've become almost knee jerk. I mean, so, so as soon as there's a problem, somebody gets sanctioned. And once you've got the sanctions in place, they're quite hard to get rid of. And the US can get away with it because of the power of the US economy. Um, but uh, I think that they, they come under the, something must be done, this is something, uh, rather than this is something that's very useful uh, question sometimes. So the, 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 there's often a good, good reason to show displeasure, but they're not necessarily that effective. And we've seen in the past how sanctions can actually be very damaging. It's perhaps the final point in economic sanctions is regimes that, um, that are corrupt and illicit are often very good at getting around sanctions. Uh, they, they organize the smuggling, they organize the rationing and the people 
um, the ordinary people tend to suffer the brunt of them. So they don't often hurt as much as they're used to the targets. The, the, now you often find individuals named as, as being sanctioned rather than whole countries, but it's quite hard to make that stick. Michael? I've got a feeling Michael's frozen. I think he might be. Uh, <laughs> do you want to address the question I had posed, which is, where does Iran fit into all of this? Well, okay, we'll talk about Iran while Michael unfreezes himself. Um, uh, so, we, we have a... In the, in the old Cold War days, it used to be quite simple. There was the Eastern Bloc and the Western Bloc, and then you had lots of countries that we used to call the Third World, uh, that many of them were be independent from empire, um, including ours, uh, and, they, uh, uh, and they were expected to join either the Eastern Bloc or the Western Bloc. And eventually uh, they decided they didn't want to do either, and started to assert themselves. Iran is, is, one, of, is one of those. Um, it, it was never part of the British Empire, but it was very much under, under British control. So the, um, uh, and there's been some documents released recently about the coup in 1953, that, uh, where the Americans and the British essentially put the Shah uh, back on the throne. So, um, Iran is a very big and important country in the region. It's got its own proud history. Uh, and in 1979, uh, had a revolution which put uh, Ayatollah Khomeini in power and which has been um, antagonistic to the United States and Britain ever since. The Iranians are probably one of the few people who still believe the British actually have enormous power over them and keep on interfering in their affairs because of what we did in the past. Um, so they have a strong antagonistic ideology, um, which has turned lots of people off. They haven't been very good at, at finding allies other than in the Shia world, they're the leading Shia power. So Iran has really shaken things up in the, um, in the uh, Middle East, uh, particularly elsewhere, but it has activities elsewhere, but it's shaken things up and caused a sort of division um, between uh, Shia countries and everybody else. And in particular, uh, it has drawn into its orbit Syria, Lebanon to a degree, and, um, uh, and not Iraq now to a degree, because uh, these are all Shia majority countries. And in the process, the Sunni countries have become um, more focused on this than they were in Israel, which is one reason why we saw this new uh, peace initiative between the U uh, United Arab Emirates and Israel. So uh, Iran um, has got uh, uh, an aggressive ideology. Uh, it, it, it's against the monarchies, it's against Zionism, um, it's anti-Western, uh, and it's established itself quite effectively. But it has enormous economic problems. It has been, going back to the previous question, it's been under sanctions now for many years. This was largely because of its nuclear program. Uh, in fact, a deal was reached under Obama, um, which uh, did in fact contain its, its nuclear program, but Trump abandoned that, reimposed heavier sanctions. It still doesn't, hasn't helped particularly with Iran's nuclear program, but Iran certainly is, is, is suffering under the weight of sanctions, but this hasn't as yet led it to a, a more conciliatory posture. Um, so it, it, it's a real complicating factor in the Middle East, whether uh, under a different American administration, there would be possibility of some sort of new arrangement, I don't know. Um, uh, I think it's uh, um, uh, most people would say that the, it, it depends on 
uh, whether or not Ayatollah Khamenei, who's the supreme leader, uh, how long he, he, he lives uh, and what sort of succession there is. So until there's a new leadership, it may be quite hard. Uh, and Iranian politics is very complicated. There's a president who's more moderate, um, but they have um, a, uh, uh, he's not the supreme leader, that, that, that's Khamenei. It's just perhaps worth noting that uh, Syria and Lebanon, which are the two countries most subjected to Iranian influence, have had a pretty torrid time. Uh, and Lebanon, as we've seen with the, with the terrible bomb blast in Beirut, is uh, at risk um, of really falling apart. Its economy is in a terrible state. And Hezbollah, which is the which was created by Iran in the first place in, in, in the early 80s, uh, is, is blamed by many in, in Lebanon for the state that they're in. So though they do have influence, it is challenged a lot as well. Um, and I imagine that, that was Judith's question when I lost you, was it? Oh, you're back, Michael, hello. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was gonna go on to China, if I may, Lawrence. Yes. Um, this is a fairly lengthy question because I, I found it difficult to condense, but um, in the light of the collapse of the old USSR at the end of the first Cold War, is China's principal political aim justified to keep the country unified to maintain its economy and the welfare of one and a half billion population, even if it involves provinces such as Xinjiang, the home of the Zhuiyas, as well as Hong Kong, the disputed islands in the South China Sea and Taiwan, recently visited by a senior US government representative. China's told us, which they China's told us is part of communist China. Should we not therefore, as China has told us, not interfere in their domestic affairs uh, in the same way that we resent foreign nations interfering in ours, although is Hong Kong an exception? Oh, there's a lot there. Um, so the question is really what counts as uh, China's domestic affairs, because yes. the question indicates China has a rather expansive view of its domestic affairs. So um, I mean, the first point about China is um, that its economic achievement is incredibly impressive. It has brought millions of people out, hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. Unlike uh, Russia, it's a, it's a major economic force in the world. It can't be ignored. Uh, as we've seen, it, 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 again, unlike the, the Cold War with the Soviet Union, when the two economic systems were pretty separate from each other, uh, China and the West uh, are in, intermingling in, in a number of ways, some of which are now becoming controversial. And the basic objective of, of Xi Jinping, Xi Jinping is, is to hold the party um, to, uh, in place. He, 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 you know, people, it, it may not seem like much of a Marxist-Leninist in terms of the embrace of capitalist me methods, but he certainly believes in a vanguard party with uh, uh, staying in control of the whole society. So, this, so you see two big things going on in China. One is the attempt to keep people happy by uh, constant economic growth, which is struggling a bit at the moment. And secondly, an enormous effort at social control, which is I think what people find the most troubling about uh, modern China. I mean, it really is big brother stuff and they have uh, used all the modern technologies of social control. So it's a really, uh, uh, and, and I think the other part of that is, uh, though they try to keep their population away from Western influences, so the, uh, the internet as we know it doesn't operate there. Um, when you see criticisms uh, as in over uh, the way they've treated minorities, um, they take them as slights and, uh, and have been gone on to the offensive in, in challenging Western countries and others that, that, that have uh, um, disputed what they've been up to. So th that's the starting point. Now, part of it is that, you know, in the 
late 19th century into the 20th century, China was humiliated. Western powers divided it up and exploited it, opium wars. Uh, so the Chinese memory is uh, of humiliation and it sort of feels what it's out to now. We, 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 we're, we're, uh, we're a big power, people can't mess around with us, we've got muscle um, and therefore uh, you, you have to respect our interests. And the problem, as the question suggests, is that their interests um, don't necessarily coincide easily with others. So you have uh, a number of disputed points. Hong Kong is the obvious one at the moment uh, because there was the agreement with the UK was that there would be 50 years uh, where, China, where Hong Kong would be separate, a very different system from China. Halfway through that, they're, they're trying to integrate uh, Hong Kong much more with the Chinese system, including this very intrusive social control. And, and uh, the, it may finish off China, uh, Hong Kong as a, um, uh, as a link between the, the West and, and mainland China. How far they go will depend possibly on how much that matters. Then you have Taiwan, which is where the nationalists escaped to after the civil war in 49, a thriving little economy that has done really very well, it's now democratic, one of those countries that moved away from authoritarian rule. Um, and they have gone along with the fiction that Taiwan and, uh, uh, and the rest of China are one and the same country. Uh, if they ever decided that they were a completely independent country, uh, China has more or less said this would be uh, Casas Belli, this would be a cause of war. Um, whether they would, not clear, partly depends on the Americans. And then you have the South China Sea, you have Chinese claims against um, islands and so on owned by the, the Philippines or Vietnam, um, islands owned by Japan and, uh, as well. Uh, and they sort of push their luck on it. They keep, they keep on asserting Sovereignty, and we don't know how far they're prepared to go on these issues. When, because if you push it too hard and you get into a, a real conflict, then uh, there's an economic cost which may affect the other side of, of keeping their population happy, and we don't know. This is all being complicated by the trade war that Trump set in motion, um, which of course is. Um, uh, I mean, it's justified in many ways. If Trump had done it differently and hadn't decided to have a trade war with his allies at the same time, uh, yeah, there was a lot to say in terms of uh, Chinese disregard of international property rights. And so How much more do you think Brexit has played a part in the relations between China and the um, and UK since the golden era in 2015? I don't did think... They, did they see... The UK as an entry point into the EU for trade? I think that was more true of Japan than, than China. Uh, and that's changed a bit because of the, um, uh, the oddly, the EU Japan trade deal, which were, looks like we'll mirror with the UK one, um, uh, took, took some of the, the heat out of that particular issue. Um, look, I mean, a lot of countries. Um, saw trading relations with the UK as a good way to get into the EU and, uh, and that's now up for grabs. Um, I don't, I think, uh, I know one of the interesting questions which may face us uh, early next year, um, is, and, and if you have a Biden administration that wants to revive the uh, Pacific trade community, there's no particular reason why the UK couldn't be part of that. But that was set up as uh, under Obama as a sort of anti-China or non-China trade community. So there's lots of questions there, but I think for China, uh, Brexit really is, is quite a small, a small issue. Can I call upon uh, Philip Newhouse, who wants to ask a question on Russia? Can we find Philip? If he's not there, I will ask the question for him. Um, yes, well, no, no, I, I am here. And my question is a, 
is a, and my question is a simple one. It's um, it's um, 100 years since the Battle of Warsaw, and I noted with some concern that the West pretty well disregarded what the Soviet Union was doing then. Given the expansionist approach of Russia now, had, uh, has anything really changed over the past century? Um, gosh. Well, you know, of course, I mean, the, 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 um, there are a number of things that we ignored uh, during the Second World War. Uh, or were aware of and chose not to make a, a fuss about them because the uh, Stalin was was our ally, um, uh, and then that changed immediately after the Second World War. Um, so, I, and I think the reactions to the Soviet, the Russian intervention in Ukraine in 2014 was was quite different. I mean, the, the objections were raised. And I think it was actually quite a factor in deterring Putin from trying to um, uh, put all of Ukraine under under Russian influence. Um, but seeing a bit of this going on with Belarus, that's a slightly different issue. So um, I, I think uh, Russia just isn't as strong as it was. Uh, and. Uh, and actually, the, the, the problems they face aren't particularly about what we're going to do about it, as they found in Ukraine. If you face popular opposition, and that popular opposition is supported from outside or just uh, generates it, its own momentum, um, it's quite hard to impose your will these days, or as we found in Iraq. Uh, so um, I think the sort of methods that you can use uh, the, the Soviets used uh, to establish control are not so easy to apply now, but there are important qualifications to that. Um, in the end, and just take an example of Chechnya, when they were pretty brutish towards the Chechens, they, um, it was in Russia, it was part of Russia, there's very little we could do about it. And then if it's got, stuff is going on and the Western media isn't there or nobody's there, as, Things we're talking about with China, um, then not much happens because there's not much we can do about it. So uh, it, it's it's not uh, it's not a simple answer because uh, you know, we we can't deal with every outrageous development in the world, and we don't have the strength ourselves. And if countries don't like it, then there's not a lot we can do about. It. But there are certain cases uh, now where you have publicity um, where you're seeing the limits of repressive power um, where our objections can make a difference and, and we can help. Um, they don't necessarily resolve things completely, but, but they impose limits on what others can do. So it has moved, uh, certainly since the, the, the days of the Warsaw Uprising, um, but it, obviously uh, in the end, the, the, if it's in another, if it's within another country, there's limits on what uh, we can do to intervene. I've got a question here, Lawrence, from Alan Patquot, who's the director of the Churchill Archive Center. Are our intelligence services capable of dealing with Russia and China? Uh, well, it's a big issue, isn't it, especially with Russia. Um, so it depends what you... So for, for first, a lot of what's going on in Russia, it, it, we can see quite clearly. It's evidence from the Mueller inquiry in the States and elsewhere, uh, and, and other stuff that, that's been done on, on Russia, that uh, we've got a pretty good idea of what they're up to, uh, and we're quite knowledgeable. Uh, so, so the first thing I think is, is that the, the intelligence services know an awful lot about what's going on in Russia. I think they know less about China. I think China is a much harder nut to crack. Um, and, you know, you have a, a problem with China is nobody quite knows how much you can trust their statistics, how much um, they're transparent uh, about what's going on. And, and, you know, if they're not being transparent with themselves, it's not so easy for anybody else to do it for them. Um, I think with, um, uh, you know, one of the consequences of the new technologies is it's much harder for 
agencies like GCHQ and uh, National Security Agency in the US to uh, find out as much as they used to be able to. I mean, there's a, an issue at the moment, apparently, as to whether Trump is going to pardon Edward Snowden, uh, who a number of years ago walked off with all the National Security Agency's secrets um, and told everybody how to protect them from Western intelligence. So for all these reasons, it's not as straightforward as it, it used to be. But actually, I don't think they do that bad a job in, um, in, in working out what they're up to. Most of it's pretty obvious. Can we bring in Martin Raven, who's just asked us a question on Brazil? Martin, are you there? Yes, I am, Michael. Evening, Lawrence. Evening, Lawrence. Uh, my, question, my question is about, as you can imagine, about Brazil. Where would you put Brazil in the global balance of power? You should answer that. Um, <laughs> um, so uh, it's, very, it, it's quite interesting because you had um, a number of years ago, this idea of the BRICS, um, of all these big regional powers, Brazil, India, Ch China, South Africa, Russia, um, that weren't part of the, of the Western world, uh, but, but all individually had, had great clout and they all seemed to be on an economic upswing, which they're, of course they're not at the moment, uh, other than China uh, and India maybe. Um, and they're all very different. So it was always it seemed to be a very artificial category, but it sort of worked uh, for member countries because it promised them a degree of power that they, they didn't otherwise have. Um, as you know, I mean, the, 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 they now have a, a demagogue as, uh, 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 in charge uh, who's had a disastrous uh, pandemic, still uh, one of the epicenters of COVID, and um, earned the world's eye by um, what they're doing in the Amazon. So I don't see Brazil as having an awful lot of clout at the moment. Um, it's obviously just about sheer size and, and location, a major factor in anything that's going on in, in, in Latin America. But I don't think it has um, the sort of influence it might have aspired to outside uh, Latin America, uh, at least uh, not at the moment. And, and you know, it hasn't done that much to be able to resolve some of the other issues going on in Latin America. So I think at the moment, um, contrary to what one might have expected a number of years ago, um, it's, it's gone backwards rather than forward. But you know, it has the potential still to be a major player, uh, but not yet. We've had a few questions, Lawrence, on the outcome of the American election, as you can imagine, and the effect. Um, a leading Democrat was quoted yesterday as saying, just because Trump looks like losing, it doesn't mean Biden is winning. Um, I wanted Malcolm, uh, I wanted to ask his question on behalf of the other half dozen who put something similar forward. Are you there, Malcolm? Is Malcolm Levi there? No? Uh, I'll ask it on Malcolm's behalf then. What effect is the outcome of the US election likely to have on East-West relations? Um, so on the first question, um, look, if, there, if we hadn't had 2016, you would look at the polls and just assume that Biden would be the next president. Uh, uh, you look at what's happened with COVID, you look at what's happened to the American economy as a result of that. Um, there's nothing that would suggest uh, uh, Trump would win. Trump hasn't um, had approval ratings uh, uh, much above the 40s since he became president. He started it with, with negative support and he's continued with that. Um, so on that basis, one would assume that, uh, that Biden will win. But we had 2016 when we assumed Clinton would win and nobody's quite got over the shock. Um, and also Trump is, uh, is doing things with the American Postal Service and, 
and so on to suppress the vote, suppress the Democrat vote. So you know, on one level, all, all that Biden needs to do is to keep on breathing uh, and he becomes president because it's an anti-Trump election. That's why a whole load of Republicans are speaking at the Democrat Party convention at the moment. Um, but Biden has, a, ha, has um, quite a lot of popular appeal. I don't think one should underestimate him. He's a exper very experienced politician. He's made, I think, a good vice presidential choice. We'll see what happens. And the debates may make a difference. Um, uh, I think the claim being put out by the Trump campaign that Biden is past it and not all there on top is, is a bit rich coming from them. And so they may uh, struggle to make that one uh, stick. Biden is, is pretty orthodox in foreign policy. I think his first priority will be to try to restore American alliances. Uh, I mean, Trump has been very bad with NATO, very bad with Germany. Um, he's, he's one of these leaders who seems more comfortable talking with authoritarian leaders than, than uh, democratic. Um, so I think Biden will be greeted with relief in the, in the, in the Western alliance and uh, he will restore that. I suspect he will um, do something to try to ease the trade war with China. But you have to remember that there's a strong view with both Russia and China and the Democratic Party that, that Trump has been their agent, certainly with regard to Russia. Um, so I think they'll be quite, they won't rush uh, to embrace Putin, um, but I think they may put an agenda on, for example, with arms control, nuclear arms control, that Putin can, that, that, that Putin can, uh, uh, can pick up on. So I suspect he'll try and moderate these tensions, but um, one of the consequences of Trump and the Russian connection is it actually made the Democrats more hawkish than they used to be. Uh, they're, they're not, uh, I mean, I think both Republicans and Democrats are not keen to have any more Iraq or Afghan type interventions. I think they've, they've moved past that. Uh, but I think they will be, uh, I think the main difference um, in foreign policy will be, Biden will just be much more traditional and try to shore up uh, the, the, the big American network of alliances. Um, can we just go back to Russia and China mm -hmm. for a moment? Um, you've already said the economic strengths of China are against the relative weakness of Russia, but um, what are the relations between the two countries themselves? And would they provide a unified front if there was some sort of confrontation between East and West? It's a really interesting question um, because in the in the 60s, um, Russia, the Soviet Union and China uh, almost went to war with each other. Um, so the two communist giants completely fell out. And, and those of us old enough to remember, we'll remember in the 70s, the Americans, Kissinger, was quite skillful in playing off one against the other. So uh, the US sort of developed, accommodated both Russia and China uh, because the two hated each other more than they hated the Americans. Um, now, since the end of the Cold War, that, that's abated. So it's not an issue anymore. Um, for Russia, the problem is that, that um, they've been completely overtaken economically by China. I mean, China you know, started off at the end of the Cold War as being very poor, uh, no longer the case. And uh, the, the Russians and the Chinese can be quite condescending towards the Russians. It suits them at the moment um, to work together and they have worked together, but the Chinese, I don't think the Chinese feel they owe the Russians anything. And if they take business from them, they'll do it on, um, uh, uh, on Chinese terms. So for example, with Ukraine, they're, they're, they're big grain exporter from Ukraine, despite this, probably annoying the Russians. So I think there are limits on, on, on how far they, they could go and would work together. But at the moment, they tend to vote together in the United Nations and, and support each other. So uh, it, it suits Putin 
at a time when he's uh, having awkward relations to his west to, to keep things as quiet as possible to his east. Um, uh, I missed um, your answer to, uh, to Judy's question. Well, one of the things, so forgive me if you've already covered this, um, but I was going to ask you how much of a threat does Iran pose to the US and how much influence has Netanyahu had in persuading Trump to withdraw from the Iran nuclear deal? And has the withdrawal been in the best interest of the West? Well, I did deal with that a bit. Let me just, let me just say a word on Netanyahu. Um, I mean, the Netanyahu has had a thing about Iran uh, going back to the 80s um, and uh, certainly was very hostile to the nuclear deal, um, in part because the, there were time limits on the nuclear deal, in part because uh, by re releasing many, it was actually Iran's, um, it was giving he was giving a boost to Iran economically. So he he, um, he wasn't the only factor. And of course, Trump was being given advice um, from the Pentagon and others that the Iranians were complying with the deal and hasn't really done an awful lot of good to move away from it. Uh, but, but Netanyahu had certainly been uh, a, major, a major factor in that. And of course, he's not alone. I mean, sort of the Saudis and the Emiratis and so on are also uh, very wary of Iran and, uh, and what they're up to. Uh, so I think that, that was, and, and that, that repeat what I said before, is one reason why uh, the UAE uh, and probably Bahrain soon um, are establishing diplomatic relations with Israel. But I, I suspect a, a Biden president, presidency will try and revive the nuclear deal. The British and the Germans and the French uh, have not abandoned it. They've tried to keep it going. And I suspect everybody's now waiting to see who's in power in the White House in January. So it could be revived. Can we bring in uh, Jack Steinert with his question? Jack, are you there? Can we bring in Jack? No, we're having difficulty finding the questioners themselves. Can you hear me, Jack? Jack was, was with us, but he's now not, I'm afraid. All oh, right, okay, I'll ask Jack's question for him. What is the likely trigger for a Cold War converting into a hot war? Hmm. Um, well, I think if, you, if you're talking with China, it's probably Taiwan. Um, possibly the South China Seas, but probably not. I think the, the Chinese will probably in the end get their way on that. But Taiwan's a different issue. With Russia, um, I think the Russians are, are, are quite cautious. I think they got themselves into quite a bellicose mood in the, um, in the middle of the last decade. And it didn't really work that out well, work out that well for them. They, they got themselves stuck in, in Ukraine, in Eastern Ukraine, uh, without it developing into the sort of movement that they thought it was gonna move into. And with Syria, uh, they've actually, I mean, they, it's one of the things about being a great power is you, you just pick up liabilities. And one of the things they've done in Syria is um, they've limited Western influence, they've kept Assad in, in power, but they uh, have got a country that's in a desperate state in which the Iranians and the Israelis and the Turks and the Kurds and all sorts of others keep on fighting it out. So it's not an easy situation. And, and actually they, they've played it quite skillfully in some ways. Um, but it doesn't need anywhere. So I don't, it's not obvious where the triggers are. If they decided, which I don't think they will, but if they decided to help Lukashenko in Belarus, um, that would be seen as a big deal, but it's not something the West is gonna go in fighting about. So um, it's not immediately obvious what, what, what causes a hot war. I, I think the, the problem for Putin is that in response to the economic sanctions and all the um, pressure that was being put on him, non-military pressure that was being put on him, 
he moved very strong into cyber attacks and information campaigns and so on. And that has got on people's nerves. It was, it was very evident with the Salisbury poisonings, what support Britain got uh, for sanctions, or basically checking out spies uh, from a whole range of countries who each had their own reasons to be fed up with what Russia had done. So I think we're more likely to, to carry on sparring in this sort of gray area short of war um, with, uh, uh, and I'm not sure what Putin, how, how Putin changes tack on that, but I don't think it leads at uh, the moment to our war. I'm actually genuinely more worried about um, China because China is, is a much more revisionist country it, it, it what it does want to redraw boundaries you know just about you know there, there, there were close there was serious fighting on the border with india quite recently um and um you know people tend to forget about india as a major power but it's a, it's a, it's a very substantial power and feels itself as a very substantial power and quite hostile at the moment or quite awkward relations with china so i, I think we're more likely to see um, China. Uh, eruptions are, are, are from China rather than Russia. We, we, we haven't spoken about North Korea yet, no. unless, uh, unless you did before. Um, what are your comments on North Korea and what, uh, how much control does China actually have over North Korea, even when North Korea flexes its muscles with its, uh, with its nuclear weapons? Um, uh, well, the Chinese say they have limited control, and um, that's probably true. They have some, they certainly do have some control because North Korea just couldn't function without China. Uh, but the Chinese, the North Koreans are very, uh, very independent. When uh, Kim Jong Un came in, um, you may remember he he not only had his father, uh, his uncle executed, he did it with a mortar. Um, to make the point that, uh, and he, his uncle was the one who had the closest relationship with Beijing, with the Chinese. Uh, so the North, so um, there are limits on what the Chinese can do. I mean, the, the North Korean story is one of the most extraordinary um, because the first year of the Trump presidency was full of this sort of fire and fury stuff. And my, my missiles are better than your missiles and my buttons bigger than your button sort of stuff from Trump and bellicosity from the north side as well. I think the North Koreans got what they wanted and that they had a, um, they demonstrated a missile capability, they had a successful nuclear test. And then Trump offered them a summit, which was, you know, something they'd been asking for for ages and sort of in, endows them with a, a legitimacy and status that uh, the sort of poor wretched country wouldn't otherwise have. So uh, on that basis, the North Koreans um, were quite happy, but and Trump was quite happy because it looked like he was making this great diplomatic breakthrough and talked almost sort of like a, um, you know, if he and, and Kim were teenage lovers uh, in, uh, in their affection for each other. But that was based on a complete misunderstanding of what um, Kim was ever offering. Because when he said he would denuclearize, it didn't mean to say he would unilaterally give up uh, his nuclear weapons. It meant that he would give up his nuclear weapons when America gave up it, or at least gave up its its whole position in in South Korea. Um, so uh, over the last year, the, the, that sort of love in between Trump and Kim has has cooled somewhat, and we're left with a very big problem. Um, uh, because in a sense, North Korea has succeeded in becoming a nuclear power and there's not a lot militarily you can do about it uh, or, and it's under sanctions. So it's something we're probably gonna just have to learn to live with. It, it, one of the reasons why nothing much was done about it is because North Korea has substantial conventional military power as well. It has artillery uh, in firing range of the South Korean capital so it could do enormous damage even without nuclear weapons. So it, it has a deterrent already. So I think the net result of this is, is having to learn to live with a, with a North Korean nuclear capability. Um, and uh, you know, Biden 
will, if he is president, will not be very happy with that. And for Trump, it's a humiliation, I think, because he he seemed to be claiming that he, he'd made a diplomatic breakthrough and nothing, and it, it hasn't turned into one. Meanwhile, you know, South Korean American relations are are pretty <coughs> have been put under quite a lot of strain by the whole uh, whole affair. Um, uh, if I can go back to just something we were talking about before we opened the, the waiting room, just to make sure that I've understood the point that you were making, that you've challenged the temptation that there are, tech, that, that there are technical fixes for what are the same political problems, despite increased sophistication of physical and psych, psychological weaponry. I, are you referring to the fact that we've had the Iraq war and we've had Afghanistan and things like that in a world where there are nuclear weapons, in actual fact, when these wars take place, they are more conventional and there doesn't seem to be any threat of nuclear weapon, weapons coming into play. Is that well, your point? Partly, but I think it, it's, it's, a, it's a wider point about military power. One of the difficulties, I think, um, in my field, I mean, be a professor of war studies, is people get very infatuated by the technology. Um, and there's always some new bit of technology coming along, whether it's drones or artificial intelligence or um, uh, new types of, uh, of aircraft and so on, and uh, uh, hypersonic weapons. There's always, uh, and people talk about them as changing everything. And if you actually look at the conflict over the last few decades, uh, first, you know, a lot of it's gone on in the third world, um, developing countries, it's civil wars. It's not fought with high tech stuff. It's often fought with uh, weapons that have been around for decades, uh, even machetes. Um, and uh, the, the sources of conflict are, are not big issues that divide states. They're, they're often uh, attempts to control local power, often uh, sort of quite basic economic interests. So um, the causes of war, the, the, the reason why wars are sustained is quite far removed from the ways that we tend to talk about it with the focus on, on high technology weapons. And what we found, and I can argue the, the, the Russians and, and others have found, is it's very difficult to bring these wars to a conclusion. Um, because in the end, they depend on, um, on, on gaining public support, on the qualities of government, uh, on, on uh, economic, uh, on the ability to recover economically from conflict. So, you know, the best predictor of a future war is a past war. If you've had a war in the past, you'd like to have one in the future because a lot of these wars never completely come to an end. And you know, a lot of the casualties of war are not because of the fighting, they're because of uh, disease and famine and so on, all the terrible things that follow wars. So I think, you know, the, 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 the points to understand about conflict, modern conflict, is that it's sustained for reasons um, often that have very little to do with the supposed matters of dispute. Uh, uh, it's just very difficult to bring them under control. And that once you've lost the economic and the social and the health and, and, and the political systems that hold countries together, it's very difficult to put them uh, together again. So I think that, that it was that sort of issue that I, that I was trying to get at. All right, um, we, we're going to have to draw this to an end, um, unfortunately, shortly, but I wanted to ask maybe the last question, what you think the world has most to fear, COVID, climate change or war? Yeah. Um, well, COVID's with us. Um, it's, uh, it's caused immense casualties. Uh, it's not over yet. It'll, it'll change the way we live uh, for a long time, it'll, but it, it'll be over. I mean, we, we know that. Climate change is already with us, but it, it's getting worse. Um, it's hard to be sure of its impact, but you can see uh, it, it's already affecting populations who have to move away from areas that have become, been covered by water and so on. Um, so, some, so I think 
I'd put that quite high. But the point about war, and especially nuclear war, is it can happen very quickly. I, I don't, you know, we, we've got a, we've got seventy five years without a third world war. Seventy five years since nuclear weapons. It was exactly seventy five years since nuclear weapons were used in anger. But these things are all over the place, and there's a lot of them around. And they could, if they happen, they would happen very quickly. So neither, certainly not COVID, but not or climate change. Uh, the nuclear war could lead to climate change. They don't compare, I don't think. Um, but these things are much more under our control. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and that's why you know, foreign policy and international relations is important because uh, in the end, there's no, to me, uh, there's no bigger danger to humankind than um, major nuclear exchanges or even minor ones, say between India and Pakistan, it, 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 the, the, the knock-on effect would be horrendous. So to me, that's, that, 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 uh, without beginning to play down the others, um, this is the major one, but it's also the most avoidable. And, and I've also heard somebody say the aging population, all the others are somehow containable and can be resolved. An aging population is just going to get worse and worse as we go on. Well, as they say, it's better than the alternatives. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Michael, Robert. have you noticed there's quite a few questions in the chat room? Oh, um, can you pick them up? for me, Judy. I, okay. I, I, um, haven't, I haven't got them coming up on my screen. Right. So Robert Bieber was asking um, whether you think the Lebanon's disintegration is likely to embolden Hezbollah, which in turn is supported by Syria, and whether it's likely to damage Russian Western relations and so risk further slippage towards Cold War. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't think, I think the Lebanon situation is quite harmful to Hezbollah at the moment. Um, I, I think Hezbollah has been holding itself back in case it's an Israeli-Iranian conflict. Uh, I mean, they're strong, they're, they're just in a part of Lebanese politics now, they're not going to go away. Um, but I don't think, uh, uh, I think there's a lot of animosity towards, towards them. The biggest risk uh, in Lebanon is a, is a return to civil war within Lebanon, in which uh, Hezbollah would be a major player. I, Thank you. I, 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 I can actually see them now, Judy. I didn't press the right button. Um, from Joe Hudley, uh, the world has indeed become far more complicated in political terms since the 1950s and the potential, potentially, and the potential for both cold and hot wars more so. How does our speaker see the world in, say, 10 years and 30 years time? Uh, I just wrote a book explaining why that's an incredibly difficult question to ask because they're always wrong. I mean, whatever predictions you make, I mean, there was a I contributed to a thing in the Sunday Times um, in, in December about predictions for 2020. You can be absolutely sure every one of them was completely wrong, and certainly including mine, because uh, nobody mentioned uh, a pandemic. Uh, so um, the simple answer is. I don't know. Uh, I think, you know, we know that we're, we're, we're about to enter a very difficult economic period. And I think the net, because of COVID uh, and, and the ability to get through this is, is going to be testing of all our social and political systems. Uh, and I, I don't claim to know enough or, or understand, for example, how the European Union uh, is going to hold together uh, if the situation worsens beyond that. You know, they've, they've taken quite a bold step already to to, to share resources uh, 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 with the with the more badly hit countries. Uh, you know, the devil. It, it's only, COVID's only beginning to hit uh, some um, developing countries badly. What's what it does to Latin America? I don't know the answers to these questions, but the, the, they're going to make a lot of Different. So we could be in for a period of, of, of political instability, which is always dangerous. If we can get through that, um, then you know we, we, we'll we'll muddle along as before. Uh, and if you look at the history of the last thirty or so years, 
there's been moments of great optimism and there's been moments of great of great gloom but there's an awful lot of continuities because uh, by and large governments do have a better understanding of, of how to um, manage some of these these big events but you know if Trump wins in November I find it very hard to see how the Atlantic Alliance could continue for another four years of of him in charge so you know, I think my my, my my I suppose my end point every time I'm asked to predict is it depends on us it depends on the choices that governments make that electorates make it's it's not uh, foreordained um, uh, and the, if you just sort of give up to fatalism uh, and assume it's all going to be terrible, um, then we might as well give up. But I don't think we should. I think, I think changes uh, can be made. And, and even if you're only mitigating bad things, at least it's better than uh, succumbing to them. Um, I've had a, a, a question I've been asked to uh, ask you on behalf of the questioner. Um, to what extent do you feel the fallout of coronavirus might destabilize world peace, either through economic collapse, social disintegration in some countries, or a world divided by nations who contain or don't contain infection? Um, well, I've answered that a bit already. I, I, I think the... Um, it's putting enormous strain on countries and, and some are, um, uh, you know, if, if Trump loses, COVID will be partly uh, partly an explanation because, because it's been an enormous failure uh, of, the, uh, of his administration. So not all the consequences may be that bad. Uh, I, I think it's good. I think the econ it's the interaction with the public health and the economic issues. Um, and I think it's just worth, worth noting that the vaccine question is become, going to become a very big one because um, how you distribute and control vaccines could well become the point at which sort of nationalist tendencies come in, in into play. I mean, you know, I think we're, we're not that far away from vaccines. Russia and now China are announcing great progress, but nobody trusts the Russian vaccine. And one of the dangers is, I think that if one of these vaccines goes off badly, um, then that will discredit uh, what we all really need, which is a mass inoculation program. So uh, again, just, you know, there's just a, a lot to play for, but some governments are, are clearly under a lot of trouble um, and will, will struggle to meet the basic needs of their populations as a result of this, already are. Um, we had a question uh, that I mentioned to you yesterday, Lawrence, that was rather on a biblical subject, rather, um, but we did bring in our new rabbi um, and asked him if he had any comments, so if you wouldn't mind, and I can get Joe, um, uh, it's John, isn't it? Are you on the, can we get you, John? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, would you like to ask your question for um, Rabbi Adrian? Are you on? Yes, I am. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Quite great. Thank you. So, if yes, John would like to ask his question. Right. The question is Is there any biblical prophecy that deals with these unprecedented times, which appear to be heralding a Cold War compounded by the, uh, the worldwide? COVID-19 um, um, epidemic, or are there any possible indications that possibly some prophecies might be um, indicative of this? Well, I'm very pleased the rabbi's here, so. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, so it is a great question, I have to say. Um, and I even would um, suggest that we have, um, at a later time, a full hour to talk about it because prophecy in general in Judaism is a, an amazing topic to talk about it. And um, also because what we can see at the moment, um, not to have a full picture of that question um, has the danger of simplifying it and then used um, to legitimate any political actions, for example. 
So I will try to give a very short answer, very short. I'm a yep. rabbi, it's sometimes a little <laughs> bit difficult, but um, what I want to say firstly is um, you can, if you want, um, you can use the Hebrew Bible and the 24 books of the Hebrew Bible to justify everything um, what's happening in the world. You just take a snippet from here and a snippet from there and put it together and you will get your answer or your prophecy. Um, but for me, and this is what I would strongly argue is um, that this is not how the Bible works and also how our tradition is teaching us to use the Torah and the Holy Scripture. So Torah, as many of you know, means in its simple understanding, teaching or guidance. Um, and therefore, the Torah wants us actually to walk in a path that God has created for us or revealed in front of us. Um, so the Torah wants that we create a just society and that we understand that our actions have consequences. Um, so one of the fundamental teachings within the Torah is that everything we do has an impact in this world. And our, or the question the Torah raises and our tradition raises is only um, how will these impact look alike? So um, using the words from last week's Torah portion, will we choose the blessing or the curse that God has, God, uh, God has presented in front of us? So um, what we can see in the prophets is that they expand on that idea. So they describe their experience two and a half thousand, three thousand years ago with the destruction of the first temple and then towards the um, um, establishing of the second temple era, what they experienced. And when people decided not to walk on the path that God revealed for us, destruction. <laughs> and then they give us hope. So this is my idea what the Torah and the scripture is about. Something about God, if we if I have that short moment, is that God, I cannot imagine that God wants us to suffer. And that therefore God created the pandemic or the current political situation. Um, I do not experience God as someone who wants us to be in fear. God wants love. That is what it says. We have to um, Adonai Elohecha, love your eternal God. Um, and we can see perhaps in Belarus, when you create an atmosphere of fear, at some point people will rebel against it. Um, but people who love, my understanding, will cling to the outstretched arm. Um, so it's important for me to uh, that we all know God didn't vote for Trump. Putin, Erdogan, Merkel, Johnson, or the Brexit. We did. Um, it was not God. So when God created the world, God created the laws of nature and the free will with all the consequences um, it comes with. Nature has no moral um, understanding and only works according to the basic laws of nature. A virus is a virus and will act as a virus. And we humans can engage in civil, th um, in evil things such as wars, and we do it. So, for me, is very important prophecy, um, only in a way that we understand how actually the world works. Um, but it is not ordained by God or not planned by God that we are struggling with what is around us. God Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. Thank you. I, I think that's a good way to end the, end the evening. We can't really cap that. Um, is, uh, is Jack there? Jack Steiner? Yes. Hello. Yes. Can I Wait hand over to Jack um, for your vote of thanks? Yes, thank you. Sir Lawrence, uh, I was anticipating 
a short uh, survey of uh, uh, politics and uh, war games in the East, but you've turned this into a sort of totally global, comprehensive uh, view of uh, what's going on. You've looked into prophecy and futurology. I think it's been a great treat. It always is when you're speaking, Sir Lawrence, and I think I uh, would ask everyone to give you some applause for this wonderful uh, lecture that you've given us. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you, and, and thank you from me, Lawrence. Uh, it's really thank been you. a delight being able to work with you on this, and I very much hope I'll be able to twist your arm and, uh, and come back and do something similar for us again. My pleasure. Thank, Thank you, you Lawrence. Right. Good night, everybody. But wait a minute. Wait, 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 wait. I'm sorry, Jack. I'm sorry, wait. Jack. There was more for you to say, wasn't there? Yes, there was. Uh, right. two, two small points, really. I hope you don't mind. Uh, this uh, uh, lecture was put on by the former AEC. And if there's anybody out there who would like to come and join our group to help present more such uh, and similar uh, activities, uh, please get in touch with me because I'm the chairman of it. And the other small point, not small point, the other point to make is those who want to uh, log to register for Mark Rosen's talk uh, on the 1st of September, please contact either Jackie or Irina Mushkina and say that you want to, and they will sort out. Uh, they uh, because they will sort out your credibility because the the talk is subject to the Chatham House rules, and so we have to be sure about security. But if you want to uh, register for those, it's Jackie or Irina Mushkina, and they will see you through it. Thank you very much. Thank That's you, Jack. Thank you. Jack, you said something about the AEC, which I assume was the Adult Education Committee. Do you want to say what your group is called now? No. <laughs> the, for, the, for, the former AEC committee. Ah. Adult Education, yes. We're now the Wimbledon Cultural Events and Activities. Well, or something like it. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not just WC at the beginning either. No, that's right. That's what Winston Churchill said. <laughs> yes. Okay. Well, I think Thanks. that uh, I think Thanks. that wraps it up. Um, thank you to you, Judy, as well, for all your help. In my in pleasure. My pleasure. Nice to see everybody. See thank you me. again. Bye. 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 Good night. Good night. Then. Bye. Good night. 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 Thank you, Judy. My pleasure. Is everybody off now or not? Uh, still got 23 people in. I'm going to turn off.